New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast mini-series titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I have put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. It's time to accelerate. Hey friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 744 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. I have another excellent episode lined up for today. Joining me as my guest will be Rob Shell. Rob's the founder and CEO of Cien. And today we'll be talking about how to use artificial intelligence, AI, to quantify the intangible factors that can positively influence your sales results. Now, among those intangible factors that AI can quantify and that we'll be talking about today are the hidden revenue that sales reps leave on the table, evaluating a sales rep's engagement ability and communication skills, meaning their individual ability to engage with a prospect and effectively communicate, We'll talk about how to measure the inferred work ethic of an individual seller versus their activity metrics. In other words, are they working smarter and harder? And quantifying if managers are unintentionally stacking the deck against the success of certain sales reps by, let's say, assessing if the leads are being distributed unevenly or evenly throughout an organization. So we'll be getting into all of that and much, much more. Now, before I get to Rob, I want to take a second to talk to you about Vanilla Soft. VanillaSoft is the industry's leading sales engagement platform. And they know that sales today is all about speed. And that's why you need to download VanillaSoft's guide on how to optimize your speed to lead. And you can get that now at VanillaSoft.com forward slash Andy Paul. Now, unlike traditional offerings, VanillaSoft does things a little bit differently. They've eliminated the list that cherry pickers love. Each sales development rep automatically gets fed the next best lead based on that moment in time. VanillaSoft instantly reacts to external triggers like buyer intent data and then pushes those leads to the front of the queue. And they automatically revise your lead cadence for your entire team when management shifts their priorities such as the usual end of the quarter push to hit target. It's all about speed. So you want to download their guide that will teach you how to optimize your speed to lead. You can get yours now free of charge at VanillaSoft.com forward slash Andy Paul. Okay, let's jump into it. Rob, welcome to Accelerate. Hey, thank you, Andy. I'm excited to be on your show. Well, it's glad to have you here. You're joining us from Barcelona. Yeah, today I'm in Barcelona. We have our R&D office here. We're also in Dallas, Texas. So where's, where's headquarters? I mean, last time I think you and I spoke, it was Barcelona. But are you, are you moving stuff to the States? Of course, as with uh, company structures, it all gets very complicated. We are a U.S.-based corporation. We've been headquartered actually in Miami because that's where I've been doing uh, business for the last 20 years. Okay. Main activity level of business is in, in Dallas. 
Got it. However, I am today in our R&D center in, in Barcelona. So Got I it. am always on a plane, basically. Yeah, I thought, gosh, I have, I've got two offices in New York and San Diego, and I'm always going back and forth. I think uh, I have it hard, but gosh, you have to throw in a flight to Barcelona. Not that that's hardship duty necessarily, but it is something I'm willing to handle. For the, for the time being. <laughs> and are you a Barca fan? Uh, I am. Are you are. Okay. Am, yeah, I'm a Barca fan. It's um, uh, it's it's an easy thing to like. Yeah, that's true. People always win, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Everybody likes a winner. Bandwagon effect. So, um, so your CEO, founder of, and you pronounce it Sien. Cien, yeah. Cien. Cien, Cien. And Cien means 100 in Spanish. You know, it is a little bit of an homage to we are here in Spain doing our R&D. Right. And it goes back to this whole thing that you want to get to 100. 100% quota, 100% on your test, 100% on everything, right? Sure. Yeah, I see that's your your hashtag. At least uh, some of your people have hashtags that, about that. Um so what was the impetus to start the company? I mean, what was the, the problem you were trying to solve? And maybe well, you can start by like, telling people a little bit what you do first. And Sure, sure. So we, are an, um, we, we help companies get to 100% quota, and we do that by using AI, primarily for SaaS businesses, businesses that are uh, growing very fast. And the reason we started this business was for like the same reason that most business, people start businesses. We were frustrated. Um, I had been a SaaS entrepreneur for the last 15, almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, last company we grew, we grew from two to 100 people uh, in, in sales in a very short period of time. And, you know, coming from more of a math, computer science background, I was like, oh, I guess I get 50 times as much sales. Guess what? I did not. And I was, during that time, constantly trying to figure out what was the reasons And even if I worked with awesome people, I could never really get to the root causes um, and the traits that were making that happen for for, for our reps. Why your your revenues didn't grow in a linear fashion with the number of of people you had, okay? So so, um, um, my business partner and I, we had had a successful exit with the last company. We worked with a new parent company for a couple of years. And then we said, "Let's, let's do something different. And um, and that became CN. Got it. And you've been around for how long? So company was originally incorporated a little bit over two and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and we started an uh, active development uh, from two years ago. So the product, explain the product. So the product is, is it a mobile app? It's a, a web app. A web app, okay. Mobile. But what we're doing is a little bit different from, from uh, what most software companies are doing. Uh, we think that something like AI is very new and hard to get around uh, your, get your head around for, for the average sales manager. Like, like they hear AI and, and maybe like they say, oh, we can do this, we can do that. Where what we want to do for our customers is to give them a chance to see what our product does without even engaging with the product. So what we have is something called a hidden revenue assessment. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to essentially get a PDF. Uh, And that PDF is an assessment of your entire sales team. And as the name implies, hidden revenue means that we think that every single team, we're not everybody's making quota. Sure. Um, And let's talk about quota, because I heard that you have some uh, uh, opinions about quota. (laughs) We can can, can get to that, yes. Yeah, um, but but everybody's not making quota. We're essentially considering that that's hidden revenue. uh, And we want to help you identify the root causes for for that hidden revenue. So what we're doing is to give you a chance to test out our software without doing a rollout, without doing any onboarding. We just want a sample of your data, anonymized, so no, so no specific information, no company names, no contact information, none of that stuff. And we analyze it using something like 200 AI models, and then we get back to you and say, here is your uh, best and worst reps and the reason why they're the best and the worst reps, and here's your hidden revenue, and then we can start digging in using the application. Okay. So... Um so let's talk then about how the application works on sort of a you know day to day basis. So is it just purely pulling information from Salesforce and analyzing and providing you know dashboard reports well, to managers or 
yeah, we put the, the tool is primarily for sales leaders. Right. Um, there is a way an individual sales rep can use it too, but we feel that sales leaders have up till today essentially been flying blind. Um, sales is to some degree, while everybody's today have a bunch of KPIs, most of the management, most of the, you know, coaching is still done. You know, you go out and down to the guy and say, what's going on? Tell me a little bit. You know, it's not very structured Mm -hmm. and it's not very measured. And that's what we want to help people understand. You want to be able to say something that is very, very powerful. Johnny, you have a problem with, with, with attribute A. A could be something like work ethic, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason we know that you have a problem with that is because we have compared it against your peers, controlling for all the factors, like, for example, that the data may not be 100% clean and so forth, right? And, say, when the, if, and then say, using something we call the value chain, if you changed your work habits a little bit, instead of going on these you know, smoke breaks every two hours and, and spending 20 minutes there, if you put in, pushed in a few more calls, if you had a few more, you know, productive activities every single day, you could translate that into an additional $200,000 towards your quota every year, right? And that is the, the unique aspect of what, what CN is doing. We look at each one of these attributes and then translate them back to value. So you don't have to worry as a manager or as an individual contributor on the things that you're already doing well on. You know, so much time today is spent on, you know, meaningless training, for example. You need to train, train on the product. Well, half of the people in that group already knows the product perfectly. And then there's a few people that don't know anything, so they need to take the training two times probably, right? That's the type of stuff that we want to help people with. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned on your website that you, you measure the intangible. So, um, obviously, that would sound attractive to some people is to be able to do that. But, but how do you do that? Like work ethic and you give several examples. I want to go through some right. of them. Are you actually, how are you tracking that Johnny went and spent 20 minutes smoking? Or are you just tracking the fact he didn't make as many calls as his peers? You just and then- have a billion cameras looking at everybody. No, of course not. So we're inferring this information and we're inferring it mostly from your CRM activities. And then every single sales leader will say, well, my sales data is not good enough. I don't have all my activities. I don't have all the things in CRM to be able to do those things. And that's true. You do not have all the data that you should have in CRM. No one has. But you probably have enough, especially if you're a modern sales SaaS type of company that are using some of the more modern tools to, to capture more of the information, that we can infer all of these things. So, for example... We can look at how much time you actually spend selling versus your peers. So how are you? How are you are on the bottom on the bottom of that what we call a bell curve, right? So if you're on the bottom left there, we know that your level of intensity in in that particular activity, be it prospecting, be it selling, be it you know upselling, be it post sales support, whatever it is, right? Um, that piece is affecting your ability to, to, to make quota. Okay. So <laughs> raise all sorts of questions for me. So, so you're trying to measure work ethic and mm-hmm. you're saying you're inferring this. And I presume part of that is on comparison to what peers are doing, but are you then also saying, uh, extending it further and saying, well, Hmm, this person, yeah, may not be making as many calls, but on the other hand, they're actually performing at a higher level. So are we dinging them on work ethic, or are we saying, oh, well, maybe actually their work ethic is better because they're being more effective than the other people who are just pounding out calls? Well, so work ethic is the intensity of, of, of uh, your things. Well, but, but, I, bring it up, but, but is, on, it, is me... it purely just quantity? I mean, no, I, I, mean do... it's, 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 I mean, again, how do you can, uh, the old way of doing it, Sure. It's activity counts. There are so many sales leaders out there today that are just sitting and seeing how many calls were made this week, how many calls were made last week. And that they then look at that. And, and as I'm, I'm sure you have heard and, and, and your entire audience has said, you, you measure, you, you know, incentive skews behavior, right? Or manage to the, to the numbers. So sure. the second you start counting something like call numbers, guess what? Call numbers go up. Yep. Does that mean that 
that um, results go up. Not always, right? right. Um, and and that goes to exactly what you're bringing up. Of course, it's not just about you know work ethic. It's also about effectiveness. So one effectiveness is is communication skills and measuring communication skills. You know, in the way that you're thinking about it, is extremely difficult. But we have found ways that we can get just as good information by using something called engagement ability. And there we're using uh, the latest in, in natural language processing. Um, that just basically means that we're using artificial intelligence to analyze exactly what's going on in each interaction mm -hmm. and then determine, for example, if Johnny sends a lot of emails that are completely ignored and Betty is sending emails that are always soliciting responses and furthers the conversations and turns it into something else. So again, um, that's another measurement. So you can be okay in work ethic. You don't have to be perfect and then be very good at engagement ability and get awesome results. Or you can be a little bit worse in engagement ability, but you're very good at, 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 at working hard. And then you can get similar results. So this goes to a core tenant that we have at CN. No salespeople are alike, and trying to clone everybody to be some kind of Michael I, Jordan is a lost cause, right? I agree, 100%. Yeah, yeah, I think it's one of the shortcomings of some of the technology that's been rolled out that people right. are trying to use it to create clones of Michael Jordan, as you said, right. uh, as, opposed to trying to, as opposed to trying to improve the, the attributes of each individual. Right. Uh, but, uh, but so, okay. So, because. Well, I, I like to ask this this question. Sure. So that it goes to the core of this stuff of what attributes, because we measure a few other things. We measure product knowledge. We measure um, value received, which essentially means are you, are you sitting on a good territory? Are you favored in your lead distribution or not? Because this is, such, I'm sure, you know, is a constant uh, chattering in, in most sales team, whether sure. you are or getting a fair shake or not, right? A few other things like the deal sizes and closing ability and so forth, stakeholder mapping. We have all of these different attributes. And what we are finding is not that you have to make everybody the same. You're making uh, everybody Michael Jordan. For, to make quota most of the time, you do not even have to be in the top percentile or anything like that because, you know, quota is in theory something that is um, attainable for the average salesperson. But the reason why many of them are not making quota is because they're failing in one or two of these core attributes. So what we're seeing every single time we make these types of um, assessments that I was just talking about, and we have done quite a lot of those at this point, mm -hmm. things you just did our 40th, um, is that the best performers, they are sitting always with what we call green badge. You can see those on our websites. They are there like with you know some really outstanding uh, abilities. The middle people, they're in the middle, and then the people that are failing, uh, they're not yet getting up to speed and so forth. They always have one or two or three what we call red badges, that there is something wrong with what they're going about. Sometimes it's fixable, you know, uh, product knowledge. You just need to send them to training and, and get them. Some sometimes are more inherent problems that, that it goes with the person that they just don't want to work hard enough to be successful. And sometimes it's even the, the sales leaders fall. They're given a territory that is very, very hard, or they're giving a new industry segment that is very, very hard for their product to, to get into. And we help every single sales leader identify those problems. I mean, I like that, that idea of the value received um, because, yeah, certainly one of the constant problems you see across companies is the uneven distribution of leads and it becomes a sort of vicious cycle that perpetuates itself as you know sales managers cherry pick leads to give to certain people that think will do a better job with them yada 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 so you, yeah you have this uneven distribution so i mean if that information's available publicly to the reps so they can see the whole team i think that really becomes valuable mm -hmm. right because it does put the onus on sales managers because one of the things that that I've seen hundreds of times in sales teams is, yeah, people who really aren't given the opportunity to succeed, right? They're given, as you said, poor accounts or, you know, not as advantaged accounts as other people. And yeah, how can you ever expect them to succeed when they're climbing a much steeper hill than other people? No matter where your sales team is working from, RingDNA can enable them to be more productive and effective. 
RingDNA offers a complete platform for remote sales teams that gives reps the tools they need to connect with more prospects and create more opportunities and drive more revenue no matter where they're working from. And managers can get real-time insight they need to coach reps to success. Win more deals from anywhere on the planet with RingDNA. Learn more about how RingDNA helps remote teams at ringdna.com slash remote work. That's ringdna.com slash remote work. New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast, And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast mini-series titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Right. And again, this is this is the 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 demystifying of, of sales to some degree, which I know you are constantly writing about and and breaking down and, and trying to turn into more scientific way. This is our attempt to do just that, right? That to say, hey, if sales is essentially a series of activities that is in, are intended to increase the value in each step from lead generation to prospecting to actual close. Well, if you can't measure the various steps, you have, you're have you operating at a disadvantage. And obviously, just counting things is not sufficient because two leads are not the same. The referral lead that you got from your best customer is much more valuable than some lead that your marketing department imported from uh, a database, right? Theoretically, yes. Yes, it should be, right? Um, so you mentioned about time reps are actually spent selling. So how, how are you measuring that within the system? So... I wish I had a like a little. I should have brought my little. Uh, oh, that's okay. Oh, we're, we're, it's a <laughs> well, test. Bottom line, but I, I'm going to try to conceptualize it here and sure. bear with me as I do that. Our technology is a pyramid, but the bottom layer is just our ability to capture different sorts of data sources. And for all intents and purposes, the most important one we always capture is the CRM data itself, including, of course, activities and so forth. The layer bit above that is to deal with the fact that no CRM data is ever good on its way. Mm-hmm. Trying to analyze CRM data uh, at face value is a fool's errand because there's always a myriad of different ways that uh, there are missing entries, there are inconsistent entries, there are methodology changes that have happened, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on and speak about mm-hmm. that for three hours, but I'm sure that's not the best use of our time today. After that, now we're trying to understand what's going on with, with um, uh, the data. So we call that the semantic understanding. That's mm-hmm. what I was talking about before, using natural language processing and so forth. So now all of a sudden, the data actually makes sense. We have corrected it, and now it's starting to make sense. The next layer after that is predictions, where we are starting to say, if all of these things have happened in the past, and we can trace this stuff with clean data, this is likely to happen in the future. And that obviously takes a lot of factors into hands. And then the layer on top of that is the value chain where we are applying dollar numbers to that stuff. And the final thing is what we call mentor, which is a prediction, or sorry, prescription engine, where we're saying, this is what you should do about it. Mm-hmm. So go back to how, so I just wanted to give you that background sure, before we I go. Got that. So Appreciate back, that. Back, to, back to how do we figure out how much time you're spending? Well, every single activity uh, has a piece of information. Um, so we're looking at, for example, if there was an email, 
uh, if it was a phone call, a lot of times we have transcripts of emails and phone calls in there. Uh, we also have statistical models that determines, you know, how long something like that takes. We have that uh, correction for the fact that we probably know that some reps may not log all of their activities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Big surprise, right? No. Um, but, <laughs> uh, and then we see, you know, how much time is spent on everything else. Uh, and by by inferring that and seeing the results of, of their activities, um, by inferring all of that stuff, we can essentially determine, and obviously not down to the second, but we can see whether someone is spending 20 hours a week prospecting or if they're spending 10 hours a week prospecting. And that obviously makes a huge difference in how much pipeline they're building, for example, right? So, yeah, just finishing up on the time thing. So what... But unless you have, unless the customer using SIN has, gives SIN data from, you know, their dialer or their phone system or so on, it's, they have to have access to all the data sources. So you can, you can get that, right? Right. So okay. uh, we, we are always trying to get as much data as possible. And this is obviously one of the challenges with being in this field of, of being data dependent. The good news and, and one of the reasons why we are all exclusively focused on, on SaaS companies, this fast growing, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. the companies that are coming out, minimum 10 reps, going up to 200 reps or something like that. That's our sweet spot. And almost every single one of those companies are using tools like SalesLoft, Outreach IO, et right. cetera, that we, we basically get very clean data, comparably speaking. Mm -hmm. We have a, on a couple of occasions taken more quote unquote traditional sales companies, and we have a much harder time. For every single assessment that we're doing of a, of a sales team, we do what we call a confidence score. With, with these SaaS companies that have that, the confidence scores for, for, for things tend to be in the 80 to 95% range. Once in a while, we have to say, there's not enough data to give up all of the recommendations that we have. We can still give you recommendations on a few items, but if you have very few... Uh, activity records and so forth log if the overall accuracy which is essentially our estimate of what mm -hmm. is missing so if you have 50 percent accuracy 50 percent of the, the stuff that should be there is not there right what we're finding for the for the SaaS businesses is that the accuracy tends to be 80 to 90 percent and that also gives us a high level of confidence so this is all um, math driven if, if you will right and we have ways to verify this stuff because we have ground truth in some instances. So we know exactly what's going on. Yeah, but I'm thinking in terms of you know, length of phone calls, right? So if you're to say, look, I want to capture every minute that right. rep A has spent on account B from initial point of contact all the way through to the deal closing. Right. And I will, can you do that? Yeah, we do that, but we don't display it like that because we don't want to mislead people to up, say that there's an uh, there's an exact thing. Because in, if you, unless of course the dialer stamps in exactly um, um, what what the time was spent on the phone, uh, we we would essentially make uh, an estimate of how much that phone call took based on the transcript, based on things like when the next phone call started, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot, a lot of different signals. Mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing with AI is that you can take all of these disparate signals that are e each one, just like you as a human, you can say, well, this, this conversation we're going to have today, it's not going to take four hours because none of us are going to do it. We're not going to be able to cover it in, in five minutes because mm -hmm. we're talking in a profound way. So we know it's going to pre probably be something like 45 minutes to 50 minutes. And that's essentially what the AI does. And then we can aggregate it up, and it becomes very useful and meaningful when you look at it from a rep standpoint and how they spent their time during a month, for example. It becomes a little bit less meaningful if you just want to look at an account, especially during prospecting where you might only spend, you know, make a few calls and so forth. But what, what we want to make sure that we're doing is to understand the level of intensity that a rep applies to a specific type of activity and, of course, also to the overall goal of their 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 uh, sales quota, et cetera, right? Hmm. And we all and and it, you you we started off and the, and the beautiful thing is that once you have that, this is kind of like a puzzle. 
And, it, and, and you know that you're right because at the end of the day, everything adds up and the puzzle comes together or not, right? So you talked about the work ethic. When we see that, if you have spent, you have one rep that has spent 30 hours in meaningful sales activities in a 40-hour week, mm -hmm. and you have another rep that has spent 19 hours in meaningful sales activity, and you see that pattern, not you know just one week or two weeks, but you see that across, let's say, you know, the last three months, for example, then it's very easy for us to compare him or her to the rest of their peers and then grade them on a work ethic scale, right? And again, most of the time, people are in the middle. That's the beautiful thing about human behavior. It tends to go into a bell curve and you try to be, you tend to be in the middle. So on most things, people are in the middle and that typically gives you the average results. The thing is that the people that are struggling they are typically on the left, you know, like on the bottom quarter, quartile or whatever, on one or two things, and then that prevents them from succeeding. And when you can identify that, all of a sudden, a problem that seems intangible and hard and, and, and it becomes very fixable, except in some cases where they, everybody agrees, this is not for me and we should not do it, right? And then at the same time, one of the things that, sales leaders come to, to us and ask all the times is, you know, my 20 person team, it's doing pretty good, but all the revenue is coming from these three guys, right? Um, like they, the, the, those mm -hmm. three people are selling everything. And of course that's not true, but that's the perception. And when we go in and look at it, it is almost always based on, on a, two factors. One, those, those reps are good, you know, they don't, they don't suck, but they're not, you know, good, good so that they are just extreme. But what, what, what happens is that they tend to be sitting on the best accounts. You sure. see them doing a lot more outs, upselling mm -hmm. than the rest of them. You see them doing uh, much bigger deals than the rest of the, the, the people. And you see them being just in very favorable territory compared to the, to the rest of them. So that, that becomes from a sales leader standpoint, Oh, I, I mean, I kind of knew it, but now I have it on paper. And then it's a question about, well, what would happen if one of them were to leave, for example? Could I then, quote unquote, we talked about you can't clone people before, but in that particular case, perhaps you are in control to, to replace that person and get similar results. Well, and that gets back to what you're talking about earlier is, is you know, subconsciously or not, it, every time I've seen a situation like you've described, which is, again, I've seen <laughs> hundreds, is the sales leader knows exactly why that's the case, right? It's not a mystery to them for the reasons we talked about before. They may not want to admit it to themselves, but they've been unevenly distributing the leads. They've been playing favorites. And, yeah, it's interesting. You know, When they get data from you, what they decide to do about it, are they self-aware enough to say, oh, well, maybe I should split a territory maybe i should you know if if these guys really were that good these top three people and yeah i've done this with clients before is you know take top people and <laughs> put them in new territories right if they're so good creating new territories they got sort of dumb fat and happy sitting <clears throat> milking the accounts they were getting from the sales leader right. it is interesting if sales leaders are actually self-aware enough to well take action or whether they as they oftentimes is. do is they just protect what they've got because they're afraid to make any changes right. right and exactly like you don't want to rock the boat but if you understand what's going on then you can take things because another opportunity is always the middle pack uh the middle pack are the people that have you know decent attributes on on everything they are not so poor on any one of these things that that prevents them from being successful at all basically selling nothing or close to nothing, but they are also not exceeding and perhaps, you know, doing significantly more than quota. And then again, what can you do with them? Um, is it one or two things that could make a big difference compared to their peers? Is it about, you know, for them, perhaps uh, increasing the, the, the territory pie or the lead distribution, or is it um, uh, the, you know, going back and saying, you know, um, if we if we changed our sales force structure and, and gave them SDRs, for example, they would spend less 
time prospecting themselves, and therefore they could apply the, their already decent skills to do more deals and hopefully actually improve on their closing skills and all of that stuff as well, right? So there are always multiple ways to skin this cat when it comes to when you, you, you're looking at a situation. And what we're always doing is when we, we're starting to work with a customer, we're saying, you're not going to like, and again, we're quantifying that. So mm-hmm. for, a typical thing, and, and this may sound strange, but it, it, we almost always get the same results. When we're looking at a company, let's say, for example, that they did $20 million in bookings last, mm-hmm. last year, we almost always find between 4 and $6 million of what we call hidden revenue. And this is the stuff that they're leaving on the table because of various problems with various reps. And the question then becomes, what problems are the most urgent? Well, we sort them by, you know, the dollar opportunity, basically. And then we say, in the next 60 days, we're going to work on one or two of those problems. So, for example, if it's engagement ability, which is the ability for, for uh, us to kind of start a conversation or re-engage a conversation that is stalled out, right? Well, at that point, you know, you start looking at who has the problem. You start digging in and how they're communicating. Are they writing that, you know, the standard sales? And I think I've seen, seen a, this, this thing too, you know, just checking in. If you looked at my, my thing from last week, just checking in. Why would I? No. I mean, obviously, I may or may not have seen the, 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 the prospecting email you sent me before, but clearly did not, you know, provide any uh, hard value for me to act. So perhaps using a different tactics, I mean, you've seen the myriads of tactics that people are using out there, videos, this and that and that. Well, now what you can do is to see what are your best reps doing How are they communicating differently? And oftentimes it's not the video. It's not the clever little joke or something like that. It is talking about the problems that those people have and making sure that that's crystal clear that you have a solution for those problems, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the just very basic. So can you, as uh, a prospector, as an SDR, as as an A that's trying to kind of restart a conversation, pinpoint back to the buyer's core issue that he or she is experiencing right now and make it crystal clear that talking to you on a call or in a meeting or a demo, whatever it is, is worth your time. That's what's giving you, that's what's giving you great engagement ability. And once you see that, you have completely different results, right? So how would you measure, you talk about value received, I guess. Mm-hmm. How would you measure value given to the to the customer? So um, that I, I'm sure you have seen tools out there for lead scoring. Um, so lead scoring tends to, t- to well, use, that's, but that's pre engagement. I'm talking about you got an AE moving somebody has to move somebody through well, the through I, the sales I, process. I, I'm, I I like to go thorough on these things. So I'm going to start with lead scoring and then go into upper to scoring because they are. They are not the same, but they are related. Um, and and uh, on the lead side, we look a lot at you know the standard attributes that 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 makes a lead good or not. How it got to you? Like was it the referral or was it the list? You know, was it SEO type of thing where people are actively searching for for your thing for your product? Um, obviously, where the person is co- located, the 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 type of individuals. So we, we do a lot of stuff to understand titles and break them out down in different dimensions, their seniority and their job functions and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. We look at all of these things. In many cases, customers come to us and say, all of those things are fine and dandy, but we also want to make sure that you're measuring this particular uh, attribute that we keep track of. And it could be a particular system that uh, people are using in their database or, or website technology or whatever. It can mm-hmm. be anything, right? Uh, so once you have all of this stuff, you run your your uh, algorithm, and all of a sudden you get a statistical probability that this type of, of lead is going to convert into an opportunity and so forth. What we're doing is taking that one step further and saying, given all we know about what happens during the sales process, let us also apply a value to that lead. Um, and we're doing that for a patent, uh, patent process that's called the CN value chain. So all of a sudden, we understand that this lead here, that lead is only worth 10 bucks. 
you know, it's not terrible, but it's certainly not something that is just going to close itself. And here's another lead that is worth a thousand dollars. Once we have now opened up an opportunity with that lead, we have the ability to do a similar thing on the on the opportunity. And there we look at one thing that I think most people that have um, looked at, um, at implementing an SDR team and been frustrated with it is that if they are not sure about the quality of what's coming through the, um, uh, the pipeline from the SDRs, right? Mm. It looks good on paper, but, but then, of course, the AE says, no, this was not a real, you know, right. SQL, right. if that's what you use for the terminology. It, it, obviously, people use different terms for, for these things, but mm. this was not something that I could act on. Uh, the guy was not ready to have a demo. They, you know, they were in the wrong industry, et cetera, et cetera. So we're taking all of those factors that you have during lead scoring, plus looking at what type of engagement have you had so far? You know, what is the expressed interest level that the, 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 the customer has find, done? And then who was it that did this stuff? Does this SDR normally generate good, good opportunities, right? And we take all of that stuff and then we say, this, is, this opportunity is probably worth X. And, and, and opportunity is obviously not worth the, the, the pipeline value of it. You know, that if the value of the opportunity that came through says $10,000, well, you know, you can send through a bunch of $10,000. That doesn't mean that every single one mm -hmm. of those opportunities is going to close. So it needs to be, a, you know, probability adjusted down, right? So these are the types of things that you're doing. And then go, <laughs> this was a long explanation and, and I'm getting very technical here, right? But I'm I, I know at least you ex appreciate that. I don't know if the audience likes it or not, but going back then to um, um, how do you know what value is? Well, you just simply add up all of those numbers and what you receive, that's what your value received, right? Well, yeah, I, mean, I, was, I think I was asking a slightly different question though, which was from the, from the buyer's perspective. Okay, from the buyer's perspective. Because... Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, or at the end of a call, I mean, how do you measure value? And okay. the and, value was delivered in 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 that particular interaction, or yeah. yes, okay. That that's that's a little bit tricky, tricky and uh, we have been experimenting a little bit with serving and stuff like that. But so knowing whether a, a, a specific interaction was valuable or not is very difficult. However, knowing if an aggregate number of, of interactions delivered value or not, it's not so difficult because that your results are, in, uh, are, are very much dependent, like are very much correlated to that, right? So well, ultimately, if, right? Right. So if you're having a bunch of, of interactions, uh, so you get that engagement we talked about before, but you're not closing, well, there was something that was missing there. And if all the beautiful thing with AI is that you can do what, what you call regression analysis, keeping all other things equal. Mm -hmm. So if you compare similar deals to each other, and then, you know, everything is the same, so to speak, except that when they interact with one rep, they don't close. And when we interact with other reps, they do close. Then you can infer that that rep that is not closing, he or she is lacking what we could call, for example, closing ability, right? Yeah, not, not, a, not a term I like because, yeah, I, I'm not a believer that there actually really is closing. I think closing is an outcome, right? It's, it's everything you do before that. It's your discovery, your needs analysis, your qualification, and so on. So it's our last question because we're, we're running a little long, but is, so how do you measure the effectiveness or can you through Sien? Yeah, the effectiveness of discovery, right? Because I know you, I mean, you could say, okay, well, this person's done a very good job on qualification, but you got to look at discovery first because qualification effectiveness is directly tied to how well they do discovery. Right. <laughs> you're stating your you're, you're questions so they become more and more difficult to answer for each one. <laughs> and I get more and more theoretical, so I'm not sure... If, that's the, the uh, I guess it's, it's nice of you to ask the, ask the hardest questions last. Um, <laughs> um, discovery, um, we are not, 
we don't have a, a measurement as of today that mm-hmm. is called ability to do discovery well or not. Um, it can essentially be inferred from a few other things. Again, we are using NLP, natural language processes, to understand a little bit about um, what's going on in conversations. And we look there for things like, you know, problems and mm-hmm. uh, definitions and so forth. So if those are pr- present, you can infer that some discovery happened. Whether the questions were exactly right or not, that, that, is, that is hard to infer. Uh, and we don't make claims that we can figure out exactly. We're, we're not mind readers, right? We cannot no, no. read the mind of the, the, the buyer. and We can't read the mind of the seller. And that's when we were talking about individual activities on, a, on things. It's always an approximation. The beautiful thing is that it sells. These things are not happening one time or two times, but they happen hundreds of times. And then the patterns emerge very clearly. And that's why we can say this is a person that has problems with things like engagement ability, product knowledge, and closing ability, which all three would be affected to some degree if you are not doing effective discovery, which in my definition is essentially just figuring out what the customer's problem is and communicating effectively about how your product or service solves those problems, right? Uh, yeah, roughly. I mean, I have a, a different definition, but we have to come back and talk about it because we're running long. But, um, you know, it's very interesting. I mean, I think this is this is a, overall just a direction that, that we have to go in sales is to to do a better job of measuring what really matters. And... Right. Uh, that you, happens to be our uh, our slogan. Thank you for. for oh well, I didn't I didn't know that, but <laughs> but but I mean, I think you're you're taking some first steps toward that. But it's it's certainly something well, that we, that makes. We are expecting to be on on this this thing for a long time. And if 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 as an audience member, you're interested in getting us assessment. Yeah, of, so tell people how they can that. can contact you and, uh, and learn more. The absolute easiest way to do that is just to go to cn.ai. That's C I E M dot A I. Yes. 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 Um, and click on the free assessment button. And essentially, within 24 hours uh, after we receive a data set from you, and you can either do that automatically through a uh, sync if you have Salesforce, or you can just send it to us as uh, anonymous um, CSV files that you can export out of your CRM system. You can get an assessment of your team completely free. And as I said, almost always we found between 20 to 30 to 40 percent hidden revenue related to these types of problems that you and I have talked about today. And then if that's something of interest, we can go in and have what we call a 100 percent quota consultation where we're talking about what you could do to fix those problems. And again, you're not going to fix all of them the first day or the second day. You will start on a measured progress for this stuff. And it's not like the traditional business intelligence where you're having, you know, millions and millions of KPIs. You're trying to understand which one it is. It it goes back to these what we call intangible attributes where you understand intrinsically what we're talking about. Work ethic, Mm -hmm. closing ability, et cetera, and helping you address those things. All right. Great. And if people want to contact you? You want to contact me? I'm on LinkedIn uh, slash Robert Cal, um, and of course uh, I'm also on Twitter. Same same uh, uh, um, token, and uh, um, just uh, love to interact. Connect with me, send me a message, and I'll respond. Perfect. All right, Rob. All right. Great to Eddie, talk with you. Thank you. And you too. Look forward to doing it again. Okay. Awesome. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for this week. First of all, as always, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank my guest, Rob Schell. Join me again next week as my guest will be Richard Smith. He's the co-founder and head of sales at Refract.ai. And in a competitive sales situation, your biggest differentiator as a salesperson is how you speak, how you sell to your customers, how you help them buy. And every seller can use coaching to help them improve their skills in all of these dimensions. So Richard and I are going to dive into how to use the latest tools, such as conversational intelligence solutions, to amp up the quality of your sales coaching. Now, you definitely want to check this out. Be sure to join Richard and me next week for our conversation. And before you go, don't forget to visit andypaul.com and get your copy of my sales growth planner for 
2020. In it, I walk you through a step-by-step -step process to create an incredibly effective sales plan that will help you hit your targets in 2020. And now this is the exact same plan format that I've used throughout my sales career to personally close hundreds of millions of dollars in sales. You want to make sure you check that out. For more information, visit andypaul.com forward slash planner to get your copy today. So thanks again for joining me. Until next week, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the Ring DNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com slash platform. That's ringdna.com slash platform.